Happy anniversary, everybody. We are truly blessed. Yeah, we are truly blessed. If you haven't been here before or you're, or you're newer to our church, this is only our third year anniversary, and we are excited about where God has done and where he has taken us. And we're going to celebrate a little bit about that today, and we're gonna, I'm going to share some vision and stuff like that. But um, as I say happy birthday, it reminds me of a Boudreaux and Thibodeau joke. <laughs> See, I'm from... South Louisiana, if you don't know that already, and we got our own brand of Cajun jokes down there that I get to transport up here to culturate you every once in a while on, on the Cajun lifestyle. And so uh, Boudreaux, he's a simple man, and, uh, but he was married, he's a married man to his, his, his wife that he loves so much, Marie. And um, everyone say Marie. Uh, Marie, my darling Marie. And he said, hey, Cher, your birthday's coming up. I, I want to get you something special. And so Boudreaux goes down to the Walmart to get his wife something extra special for her big birthday coming up. And his buddy Thibodeau sees him leaving the jewelry section of Walmart. And, um, and Thibodeau says to Boudreaux, hey, Boudreaux, what you doing with that nice shot, little, little box you coming from the jewelry section in the Walmart? And he said, my wife Marie, it's her big birthday coming up. And he goes, oh, what did you get her? He said, I asked her before I left the house, what would you like for your birthday? And she said, just make sure it has a lot of diamonds. And Thibodeau said, all right, all right, I see that little box. What would you get her? And Boudreaux goes, oh, this little box, this is her gift. I got a lot of diamonds. I got our deck of cards. <laughs> Whoo, come on. That's good. I don't care what you said. All right. <laughs> Happy birthday, Live Church, and um, I, I hope that when you came in, our host or greeters gave you one of these books right here, and if you didn't get one, we want to make sure you have access to one before you leave, and um, online, you'll just have to listen to some of the numbers. I don't think we got it on our website yet, and we caught that. We'll, we'll make sure that we get a version on our website this week, um, but this is our 2021 end of the year report. We want you to see what you're giving, what your worship, what your, um, your, your presence and your serving is accomplishing. And so I hope that you have this right now and you'll open it up with me because I want to highlight some of the things that God is doing. I won't go through the whole book, but we hope that you'll study it and um, if, if you want to share it with others. But um, we're just so excited on how God's moving. Here are a few things that are sticking out to me. 682 decisions for Jesus Christ since the launch of our church in three years. Come on. There is nothing that will move me more than a person checking a box saying, I'm giving my life to Jesus Christ or I'm recommitting my life to Jesus Christ or raising their hand and saying, it is time for me to give my life to the Lord. I am so excited about that. In fact, in 2021, a year that could be um, arguably harder to do ministry, we saw 249 salvations in last year alone. Come on. I'm so pumped. 31 decided to get baptized, and we got baptized. We baptized 31 people last year. Our soul youth, which is our middle and high school, they're seeing uh, 40 students in the room every single week that we're ministering to, and it's growing. Um, many people asked at the end of the year, we took our legacy offering, and how'd we do? We actually printed a number that I forgot to add uh, the match in there, and so actually what was given in legacy this year was one almost one hundred and forty one thousand dollars was given in legacy to advance the vision down five legacy lanes local missions national missions global missions lift college I'll talk more about this a little bit in a later and then also lift church and so uh, we are so thankful for everybody's generosity that was over and above the operating budgets tithes and offerings we saw 649 new Facebook followers which means their influence is growing and we so thank you every time you share you click you like you click you love you share something um, it, it's so helpful to get the message out 191 people served on the dream team last year Come on, guys. I've always wanted to be a part of a church where it's not just a, a few select people, but it's the whole church owning this thing and saying, I'm called to live to 191. We added 45 new dream teamers last year through Next Steps. Um, that equaled 15,000 hours served setting up church last year. Come on. I love the generosity of people giving up their time. 
250, more than 250 people in small groups this past year in a combination of 42 different groups. I love that. That means that about half of our church is in small groups, which is one of the... Uh, which is the discipleship muscle of our church. And I hope that today, before you leave, you'll find a small group where you can find a home as well. Some of you are into numbers and you'd like to know how your giving is being used. Well, last year, our tithes and offerings came almost to 418 thousand dollars last year that represented a 49 percent increase from the year before and it exceeded our budget that we set last year um, if you'd like to know how it was spent we have four main categories we spend money and we have a board of six people in our church um, who who oversee our finances and make sure it is in good standing and you and stewarded well so our four categories are facilities missions ministries and salaries on facilities, because we rent and lease, we kept that down to only $65,000 spent in uh, leases of various properties. That's only 16% of the budget. That's super low and incredible, which allows us to save more and, and invest in our future. Also, missions, we gave um, uh, 11% of our budget away. We said we'll never give less than 10%. So we gave away $44,000 out of our operating budget. And then when you add the legacy lanes that we gave through our legacy offering we gave away fifty six thousand dollars outside of our walls last year guys come on I love that there is going to be advancements and building of the kingdom that we might not get to see with our eyes but God is using us to build the kingdom beyond our four walls um we gave, uh, uh, we funded about $121,000 towards ministry. 35% um, went to salaries. Um, and so that's a great low number. Also, capital investments, which means investing in gear that we can use both now and when we get a facility. We were able to invest $42,000 into our future in gear, like broadcast gear, like our band that we just picked up. Eight friends and members of Halo that came to church this morning. Come on! Let's give it up for our friends. We're so thankful to see you in the house. And so investments like that. Also, our college saw six new college enrollments. We got six new students and five new degrees offered. And that's just a little bit about what is going on when you lift. Come on, is that not exciting? There's plenty more for you to look at. Hope you check it out in, uh, on, um, as you take it home with you. And so that tells me um, that I, I, it sets up my message that I want to share on a third year anniversary, a message I've called Four Eras, Four Takeaways. Um, four Eras. The church throughout the Bible has gone through four different eras. Now, the church was referred to uh, in the Old Testament as a tabernacle. When I say church, I mean where God's presence dwelled. And so we've talked about this in various sermon series. Is if you've been here, if not, check out our podcast. Um, but it was a tabernacle, and there were four eras. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull out my handy-dandy um, uh, drawing app because I like to do this from time to time. Um, hope you'll entertain me as they throw this on the board. Um, we good to go? Is it? Oh, there it is. Look, we got it. Oh, squiggly line showed up. We're in. We're in business. Um, let me describe a, a little bit of history from your Bible so that you can understand what it means for us today. And, and so, bear with me if you're not the biggest history buff, or uh, if you haven't read every single line of Leviticus. Okay, bear with me. I'm going to try to make this uh, easily attainable today. Um, the tabernacle began like this. It was a tent. Um, uh, and so God's dwelling place was in the middle of this tent. And um, this was the first time the tabernacle was ever set up. It was set up in the book of Exodus by a man named Moses, as well as Aaron and the Levites who maintained this tabernacle. God's dwelling was inside this tabernacle. After a period of time that um, this was uh, a tent because it could be moved whenever God's presence moved as they were on their way to the promised land. 
After a period of time, they finally came into the promised land, and uh, King David had a vision to build God's house, a, 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 a tabernacle, a real house, and God said that he would not build it because he was a man of war, but his son Solomon would build it. And so the second temple is often referred to as Solomon's temple in history books, and in your Bible, in Kings, you'll hear about the building of the temple and the dedication of the temple temple. Now, after a period of time, God's people would lose their focus that even though this is no longer fixed, that God's dwelling place was in this. Look at this huge upgrade. But all the elements are still there. The laver is there. The wash basin, the brazen altar is still outside. But after a period of time, God, God's people wandered and got distracted. The Babylonians came in under King Nebuchadnezzar, tore this temple down and it had to be rebuilt. And so the third era of the temple was a smaller one, um, but it was equally a place that God met with his people. And um, you will find this in, in the book of uh, Zechariah. Oh, look, my handwriting's terrible. Or um, Ezra or Nehemiah. They all are a part of rebuilding the temple. And um, this is actually the temple that Jesus would have worshipped in. If you're like, Pastor Drew, you're losing me. Stay with me because it's all going to line up in just a minute. Jesus showed up on the scene and this would have been the temple that Jesus actually worshipped at because this temple was torn down again in 70 AD and we know Jesus died somewhere around 35 AD. And so Jesus would have been a part of this temple but something incredible happened when Jesus showed up. Up. Something uh, paradigm change, changing happened when Jesus showed up and he took on the cross of Jesus Christ because the modern day era of the temple is no longer a building. It is this building right here has moved inside of each of our hearts. God wants to now dwell inside of us. Where is God's dwelling place today? Is it in this regal theater? No, it is not. It is in the people of God's lives. And so um, I point out all of this because it's not wasted ink when our Old Testament describes all this. All of this era over here was incredibly public, but um, this new era of the temple is very personal. But I believe this, the public shapes the personal. In fact, today, I'm going to start right here and talk about this, but I'm going to go back and show you how the first tabernacle, second tabernacle, and third shape how we should set up our personal tabernacle in our lives. If you're following with me, say, I'm following with you. All right, sweet. They're going to take this down, and I'm going to switch back over to my notes as I um, get into the four eras and the four takeaways. Why am I breaking this down? Because I want you to see what we are trying to do at Lift Church, why we are trying to do it, um, what we, where we're going, and how you play a crucial part in making it happen. Tell your neighbor, get ready, get ready, get ready. So let me start on the fourth era, the modern era of the tabernacle, which is it within our hearts. Put your hand over your heart. This is where God wants to dwell. You get to make the decision whether he gets to fill it or not. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? In other words, it's no longer about tents, and it's no longer, well, we all carry an earthly tent because we're a temporary being. But anyway, I'm pretty, that's another message for another day. We are a body, and we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he wants to dwell in here. John 1.14, when describing Jesus Christ and coming, it says, so the word became human and made his home among us. Now, when it says made his home among us, the Greek word actually means he tented among us. The immediately, God's people would have immediately pictured that tent of the first tabernacle and go, oh, whoa, 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 wait, the way that Moses' people could meet with God and have a dwelling place with God, Jesus is now tenting among us. It also means he tabernacled among us. So they went ahead, maybe they had a picture of Solomon's temple or the rebuilding. But all we know is that Jesus wants to dwell within us and among us. So as I said, the public shapes the personal. And so what does the public tabernacles or those eras teach us about setting up a personal tabernacle in our life so that God can dwell? You ready? 
Here we go. Here's the first one. Um, it started in the book of Exodus, chapter 40, as they put it up on the screen. Moses is talking with God, and, and it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Set up the tabernacle on the first day of the new year. Place the Ark of the Covenant inside. Install the inner curtain to enclose the Ark within the most holy place. Then bring in the table and arrange the utensils on it. And bring in the lampstand and set up the lamps. And I think I hear somebody up there going... Some of you are like, I've read that before. It put me to sleep. I don't know what all that matters. Can I? That was the NLT version. Can I give you the Pastor Drew version, the PDV? Here you go. Here's the PDV version of what I just read. Set up the church on the first day of the week. Pray in the presence of God, and you're going to need a lot of pipe and drape to pull this one off. Get you some tables with some stretch fabric. And a lot of worship utensils, a.k.a. subwoofers, electric guitars, microphones, and drum sets. Oh, and you're going to need some good lighting, too. Come on. The rest of Exodus 40, if you read it, actually looks a lot like what our dream team does every single week, setting up and changing a regal theater into a tabernacle. It talks about um, having worship utensils. It talks about having prayer rooms. It talks about having places to walk your soul from and so it, it reminds me of times of salvation and times of prayer and so here's the first thing the first tabernacle was portable the first tabernacle era was portable here's the first takeaway of the tabernacle the tent is meant to move what can we learn about setting up our personal tabernacles by the first one the tent's meant to move Okay, let me make this very applicable for everybody right now, okay? Because you're like, I don't know about this whole tent thing. The reason God set up a tent is because God was saying, don't get comfortable where you're at. When I move, you move. There are a lot of people who want to follow Jesus Christ. But once they get a few Bible verses to counteract, you know, what I'm going through, once I memorize a few, once I've done maybe a class or two, once I've gotten into this kind of relationship and we call it a Christian marriage, they set up a, a static fixture tabernacle and they say, I ain't moving again. I haven't moved with God in quite some time. I haven't met with God in quite some time. And what God was saying to Moses was, I am going to be moving. Will you move with me? Like, people can say, oh, that tent um, tabernacle it tells me about a tent revival. We should have a tent revival in the middle of the summer. And as pastor, I'm going to go, no. Air conditioning is a very good thing. <laughs> God is on mission. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But his mission is always seeking to complete it no matter what era he is in. And so times change, cultures change, and God is wanting us to move along with it. And so, hey, no hate towards anybody who wants to have a tent revival. I just don't think you're going to reach a lot of lost Americans holding a tent revival in a 100-degree tent in the middle of the summer. I think we're going to reach a lot more of our friends you put on some AC. <laughs> it's just my mentality. And so that's why we need to be ready to move. We need to be ready to leave the old things and take up the new things. And can I tell you that sometimes our ways change, but our message never changed, right? It, it, the worship songs may sound like this, this decade and next decade, they'll be different. And we're going to move along with God. And you could say, but I like the old stuff better. But if this is how God's reaching new people and lost people, we're going to go with it. Come on, that might make some uncomfortable. But in other words, he was saying this is a journey. Don't get too stable. Don't get too, uh, don't get too steady to follow me. Don't get too comfortable. There was a cloud by day and a fire by night, which means that when that cloud moves, you are going to get torched in a desert. They were moving in the middle of a desert, a hot desert, Egyptian desert, y'all, which means you're going to get torched if you don't move with the cloud by day. That cools the light, keeps you calm. Keeps you, keep you cool, calm, collected. And then deserts get cold at night, so you better stay near the fire, which will also be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. So that when God says, I'm moving east, will you say, pick up the tent, we're going east? Or will you say, I kind of like it this way, and I'm not changing? 
The first takeaway of the tabernacle is that the tent was meant to move. Um, it kind of reminds me of the mission that God's on and our mission. He lifts, I lift, we lift. Can I teach you uh, our mission from Exodus? He lifts the cloud by day, uh, uh, the fire by night. In other words, we are lost without this cloud. We are torched and we are toast without this cloud. We need the fire or we are wandering. And today, I believe that God wants us to equally know him the way they knew him. As long as they were close to the fire and to the cloud, they knew God and they knew what direction and we want to help people know God because he will lift you up and he will help you in your wandering so that you're not lost and then I lift reminds me that when God moved they all had work to do do you know they all had assignments it was like they were a dream team they were all given assignments that when I move this is what it looks like in numbers chapter 10 when the people set out and God moved for the first time Judah's troops led the way so they had leaders then the tabernacle was taken down, and the Gershonite and Maronite divisions of the Levites were next in line of the march, carrying the tabernacle with them. Okay, so they're bringing elements of the tabernacle. Next came the Kohathite division of the Levites, carrying the sacred objects from the tabernacle. Before they arrived at the next camp, the tabernacle would have already been set up at its new location. And oh, by the way, Dan's troops... They went last, serving as the rear guard for their tribal camps. Even the Israelites had a security team on their dream team. Come on. <laughs> they said, hey, uh, uh, tribe of Dan, you're going to be the muscle in the back. Anybody try to jack our tabernacle, you set them down, right? Because we're on a move with God, and we are God's people, and God's doing something, and we're going to follow him. And so it reminds me that we want you to discover purpose in carrying the tabernacle too. In fact, if you're trying to learn how to set up a personal tabernacle, a personal relationship with God, help us set up the public tabernacle and teach you a lot about what to do on the inside. Listen, um, and thirdly, we lift. We, 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 they never carried the tabernacle in isolation. It reminds me that we got to make a difference. Everyone was making a difference. Guys, there's 40,000 people who live in Salisbury and call it their home. There's 400,000 people who call the Salisbury metro area our home. Now, we might be reaching about uh, uh, more than 400, but that's just a drop in the bucket. God's got some lost children, and we all need to make a difference. This is God's mission. And we got to move with it. And I celebrate what he's done. But I also can't get stagnant in one place. If God wants us to reach some people. Amen. First Peter 2.9 says, you all are a chosen people. You all are royal priests. Tell your neighbor, you are a priest. Which means you got some lifting to do. We're all called to. We're living stones in his tabernacle. And there are three ways you can do that. Number one, you can actively pray for this church. Will you pray and intercede and spend time and put it on your prayer list and ask God that he would use us to reach his lost people in Salisbury, to, to pastor his newly saved people, to equip his saints and to send people out to make a difference in this world? Will you also, number two, the second thing you do is give. Every single time you give, you are part of making this happen. This doesn't happen without generosity. None of these tabernacles help, happened without funding. And so uh, their tabernacle was built by their offerings. And third, join our dream team. Maybe you've been on and haven't served in a while and it's time to get back your hands on and lifting. Or maybe you say, it is time for me to take my next steps and to join our dream team because now I get why I need to build the public tabernacle. Let me move on. Number two. 2 Samuel 7 verse 2 is about King David. And King David looks around and he says, why in the world am I living in a cedar house? He says, um, here I am living in a house of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. And so the second tabernacle was central. Now that God's people moved into the promised land, they now set up the tabernacle in a central location. What does this mean for you and I? The second takeaway of the tabernacle is you've got to put Jesus at the center of your life. It is so easy to put other things at the center of your life. 
We can put Jesus at the center of our life on a Sunday morning, and then we put our family as the center of our life, our income as the center of our life, our career as the center of our life, our hobbies as the center of our life, our entertainment as the center of our lives, ourselves as the center of our lives. Know anybody who suffers from a little bit of narcissism? That's about all of us. (laughs) Nowadays, we all have a lot of self, and we want to live on what's convenient for me. But when they entered the promised land, they said, we will not put Jesus' temple or or God's temple, his dwelling place, out on the periphery where it's out of sight, out of mind. We will put it in the center so that every time you go to the marketplace, you remember God. So that every time you go to your friend's house, you remember God. So that every time you take your kids to school, you remember God. Do you know at Live Church, we've been offered some land on very periphery um, um, cities, and we've turned it down? We've also turned down opportunities to be on the outside. We chose to launch into Regal because Regal always makes sure they are in the center of the city. And we are believing that God will open up a spot that will be in the center of the city. Because we don't want to be out of sight, out of mind. God shouldn't be out of sight, out of mind. We want to be a beacon of light saying, hey, city, you need some hope. This is where you can find it. Come on, come on. Many Christians carry Jesus on the fringes of their life. They follow when it's convenient, and when it becomes inconvenient, they drop it. Or out of sight, out of mind. Or writing their own doctrine of who God is instead of seeking God's word for his doctrine on who he is. In fact, uh, Isaiah says this, Woe, or what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. That dark is light and that light is dark. That bitter is sweet and that sweet is bitter. Know anybody who is trying to make up their own decisions on what is good and what is bad? It says, what sorrow for those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever. See, this is one of the reasons why we, built a, uh, we have a college and we partner with Southeastern University for accredited degrees because there are people wanting to study for their calling in life and they feel like they have to uh, lose their centrality of Jesus to go to a university nowadays. And, and we want to give you an opportunity that if you want to keep Jesus in the center or in his, and his church in the center, you can pursue your calling all while pursuing that. Listen, you can get an accredited degree like SU or uh, uh, U. UMES or University of Maryland or Duke or Princeton or anything like that. It's fully transferable, but you can start here and you can pursue your calling anywhere, uh, anywhere you want to go as long as, but, but you get to keep Jesus at the center of it. You get to keep his house at the center. That might not be for everybody, but it is an opportunity for everybody on the Eastern Shore. That's why we, we did it. Um, also, this second tabernacle would be built, uh, would be torn down by the Babylonians when God's people lost their way. And so it, here's the third takeaway of the tabernacle. The state, this one, might, this one might hurt a little bit. I step on a few toes. The state of the public tabernacle tells the state of the personal tabernacle. Let me explain. When God's people were all about God, they were like, you deserve a tabernacle. We should build you a magnificent place. We should meet with you regularly. But as they got comfortable... They started neglecting it. They stopped making pilgrimages to it. They stopped keeping themselves pure and devoted only to God. They started introducing foreign things and foreign gods and other pursuits, and they lost their first love. And their personal tabernacle was in shambles long before the public tabernacle got torn down. In other words, when the public tabernacle is neglected, it's an indication that the personal tabernacles have been neglected for quite some time. The state of God's church has nothing less to do with, no, I can't say that. Leaders have a big part to play in it. But do you know that every member plays a part? And you keeping your personal tabernacle in order makes for the best church around. Our church is fantastic. This is a beacon of how fantastic you guys are because you've been keeping up your personal tabernacles. But let's never get lethargic. Let's never get complacent. Let's never get stagnant. Let's never settle down so much that we say, I don't need the tabernacle today. I'll be back in a month. I don't need a pilgrimage this year. I don't need to keep it as the highest priority. I got other distractions. Every time God's people got distracted, they lost their public tabernacle. But it was just an indication that their personal one has been in shambles for a while. 
So, um, number three, the third era of the tabernacle starts in Haggai, verse 1. God says, why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? Now go up in the hills, bring down timber, and rebuild my house. Then I will take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. And so God's dwelling place, the third tabernacle era, proves God's unstoppable. Oh, this is where I get pumped. Because when they knocked down, when the Babylonians came in and said, we don't like your Israelite God. We don't like what y'all stand for or believe. We're going to knock your temple down. We're going to send y'all in exile. We're going to scatter you guys like, like roaches when the light's been turned on. Come on. We're going we're gonna to get rid of you guys. Guess what? Only 50 years later, they started erecting the second tabernacle. In other words, you can't stop this. You can tear down our building. You can burn it up. But this is not, God must not be dwelling in bricks and mortar. He must be dwelling in a move of people. A movement of people. And that you have not killed them. You have not destroyed them. Do you know that church thrives best? God's kingdom thrives best when it is persecuted. Church history proves that when people will say, I don't know, Pastor, times are getting dark. I don't know what's going to happen. I do. It means a resurgence of the church, and Lyft is going to be ready for it. Okay, do you want to know why? Because every time Christianity is persecuted, it thrives. It grows rapidly. In the first century, people were burned at the stake, used as human torches to light up their festivities by King Nero. Guess what? They grew from about... 16 apostles, you know, 16 followers to 2,500 in about a, a thousand years. How? Because it, it blossoms when it's persecuted. You want to know when Christianity slows down? When God's people get comfortable. We got our building. We got our fancy songs. We like that song. We're going to stay there. I like my stuff. I don't, don't mess with my stuff. This is all mine. Now let me go pursue other interests. And God says, return to your first love. And so I wrote this down, guys, that our fourth takeaway is, uh, of the tabernacle is God is a God of restoration. When he restored the temple, it was as if heaven went, ha, ha. <laughs> y'all thought y'all killed it. Let me tell you about Gamaliel in the book of Acts. He was on the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee of all Pharisees, and he was with a board talking about what we're going to do with these hated apostles because they just keep talking about Jesus. And Gamaliel said this. He said, be careful what you do to these men. I advise you to stay away from these men. If what they are planning is something of their own doing, it'll fail. It'll go away in no time. Kill, strike the leader, they'll all scatter. But can I tell you one thing? If God is behind it, you cannot stop it anyway. In fact, you might find yourself fighting against God. Tell your neighbor, you can't stop this. Some of y'all need to get educated on that song. You can't stop. Okay, anyways, on our pre-service roll, some of y'all feel me. Others are like, what's the brother talking about? Their group was unstoppable because their God was unstoppable. Do you have a group you run with that you grow closer to an unstoppable God with? If you don't, Small Group Sunday is today. You should not leave this theater today. You should not get off of this experience today without immediately shopping on our website for a small group to belong to so that you can run with a group of people pursuing this unstoppable God. Come on. So uh, write this down. God wants to use his public tabernacle to restore personal tabernacles. Why do we meet today if it's all dwelling on the inside of us? Because God wants to restore a personal tabernacle in her and in him and in everybody online and in people we haven't reached yet. Marriages being healed. Come on, finances being freed up to be used to build the kingdom of God. Come on, uh, physical health and healing. Come on, mental health restored. Come on, eternal restoration, knowing that I'm going to heaven and not hell. That's what the public tabernacle's for. And it's not for just having good church. In fact, I wrote this down. When we get a fixed facility, it will never be to get comfortable. It will never be so that I got mine, so that, ooh, church was good today. I hope that happens as a side effect. But it will be a central public place 
used to restore people's personal broken places. I'm going to say that again. It will be a central public place primarily used to restore people's personal central places. Come on. That's what the house is for. It's what the tabernacle is for. God wants to dwell in you. So I close today. Say we want to be moving with God like the first tabernacle. We want to be putting Jesus at the center of it all and not on the periphery. We want to be full of healthy, private tabernacles. And we want to be seeing restoration regularly. And you know what? We are seeing restoration regularly. We put together, um, we prepared a few testimonies of restoration that God's done recently. And so stay seated as we show off some of how God's building his church at Lyft. For about 10 years, I was battling with severe depression. As a Christian in church for so long, I felt like I couldn't label it or I wasn't doing something right. I thought faith was saying it wasn't so in Jesus' name without addressing it. In September 2019, I told God that I have reached my breaking point and that I refuse to live such a roller coaster lifestyle any further and I surrender it all to his complete control. About four months later, in January of 2020, I saw a postcard about Lyft Church and decided to give them a visit. From that day on, my spiritual life began to change. From the welcoming team at the outdoor entrance to the ending of the message, I felt my spirit was fully awakened and activated. It was like a change from dim lights to bright lights. To me, God's words are a roadmap to success in every aspect of a person's life. Hearing the wisdom of God through Pastor Drew's messages is truly uplifting to me each time I hear it. The messages are simple and edifying for all to eat and digest. At Lift Church, I have learned the true meaning of humility in Jesus Christ. No matter where you are in your walk with Jesus Christ, or if you are just starting to find out about him, you will easily find a place of belonging at Lift Church. The message in the environment is welcoming. There is no pressure, no feeling of being judged. Most of all, you don't receive harsh tones or words that make you feel like a failure. The messages are an encouragement to face your battles with God as your compass and clear steps to help you get back on track and do your best to stay on track. Similar to what is written in Ephesians 4 verse 2, be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. I love Lift Church and what God is doing here in the biggest thing of all. I found a place I feel comfortable to openly invite people to come to hear the word of God. And I know that if the person truly gives Lift Church a chance, they too will find an uplifting spirit of Jesus Christ and find a home at Lift Church. Chief cornerstone, no other foundation can be built upon. Not philosophy, no other wisdom of man on the other ground is sinking. Upon this rock you build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail when we bow. family found Lyft through an amazing youth pastor who was following the leading of the Holy Spirit and reached out to my son at his school chapel at Holly Grove. I was introduced to Lyft my freshman year of high school. It was our school chapel at Holly Grove and I remember this guy preaching the best sermon I had ever heard at the chapel. That same year my papa had passed away and I was going through it. I needed someone I could talk to and after JT's first message I knew he was the one. I got his contact information after chapel 
and we've kept in touch ever since. He would talk about Lyft Church at the movie theater and it always sounded fun, but my parents were lifetime members of another church and didn't really feel like starting over at a new church. Unfortunately, at that church, we did not have a youth pastor. I needed some way to get and enjoy Jesus, but it wasn't happening. Still, JT and I stayed in touch and I always looked forward to whenever he'd come to preach at our school chapels. Earlier this year, my senior year, JT and the SOL youth worship team came to chapel again and I went home talking about it. To my surprise, mom and dad were eager about trying out Lyft. Just two days prior to that chapel, my wife Heather was at our church altar, earnestly seeking God's direction for our family and especially Jacob. We know God has a special calling on his life and we wanted to be somewhere his life would be poured into. It was during this prayer time we both felt, as Pastor Drew says, the nudge in our spirit. We both knew and had peace that God was leasing us from our church to start something new, but we had no idea what he had in store for us. We had been at our church my whole life, but had been looking for something more. Heather and I had seen God do amazing things in our lives and others, but I'm still standing in awe and wonder at how, through his sovereign and perfect plan, he opened the door on Jacob's heart to receive the invitation JT gave him to come to Lyft and check it out. When Jacob told us about Lyft's youth team at chapel, I could see he was very excited about going. Heather and I said, if you're going to Lyft, we are too. Our first Sunday we came was September 19th, and as we were walking up the sidewalk, the Lord was preparing my wife, but I was still anxious. I didn't know what to expect. I immediately felt the love of God <laughs> from the people greeting me and my family. A little boy that was greeting ran over to my three-year-old daughter and gave her a high five. I felt the peace and the joy that I had been missing for a long time. We talked about our first experience of Lyft all the way home. We never looked back as we have found our new home. Coming to Lyft was the best decision ever. Before Lyft, I can honestly say that I didn't like church at all. I thought it was boring and I felt like I was being dragged every Sunday. I always tried to get out of it, but after coming to Lyft Church, I can finally say I love going to church so much. Just in these past few months, I've grown in my spiritual walk with the Lord. We are getting so blessed and filled each week. It's been absolutely amazing. The way the Spirit is welcomed in each service and has the freedom to move and minister to hearts and lives. Wow, we're so blessed to be part of this church family. day he was warning me that if I continued down the path I would suffer the same fate my neighbor did. I talked with him and thanked him for speaking to me in such a powerful way. For so long I felt alone but he made it very clear he had been with me the entire time and my prayers had been answered. I went inside, rinsed my drug down the drain and talked with him for the rest of the day. The next morning and for many to come I did not feel the urge to use again. I tried quitting so many times and failed, but after that moment, it felt like I was cleansed of my addiction. I've continued to draw closer to him, which has led me back to church. At Lyft, I feel like I am home and experience an undeniable feeling of peace and comfort. It was so different than any other place I had been. There was a spirit of freedom as soon as I walked through the doors for the first time. I felt my burdens being lifted and I'm still not perfect, but at Lyft, the message keeps drawing me closer to my father and further from the sinful life I used to live. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up, it's your church. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up, we're your church. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up, it's your church. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up. We are build your church, build your church, build it from the ground. It's your church, build your church. Oh Jesus, build it from the ground. 
building the church. Come on, can we give him a shout of praise? Come on, I think someone needs to stand into their feet this morning and give him a shout of praise for what he's doing. Come on, God, you are so good. God, you're building your church. You're building your church, God, and the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. God, we praise you. Come on, can we give him five more seconds of praise? God, you are so good. God, you are great. God, you are the alpha. You are the omega. You are the cornerstone that we built this church on, God. And the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. Come on. Can we give them another shot of praise? Come on, God, you are so good. Come on. I love seeing the way that the Lord has moved throughout the years. I love seeing, you know, young Pastor JT and young Terrence, you know, up there on the screen and how much we've grown with y'all as a church. Y'all can go ahead and take a seat. Thank you guys for joining us today. This is a great day. Come on, three years of God's faithfulness. Three plus years. It started way before we launched the church. And I don't think God is done. I, don't, I know God is not done building his church. And I, in fact, I think he still wants to build his church right now, today. And I feel like there are some people in this room that just like in those testimony videos are feeling that nudge. You're feeling that, that pull back to God or maybe that pull to God for the first time. And I want to give you a chance today to join this thing called the church and that God is building. And so in just a few moments, I'm going to ask you to, to raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for. Every eye is going to be closed. Every head is going to be bowed. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you up. I just want to know who I'm praying for. And I, and I think it's important that you say, that's me. And so with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, if that's you this morning, if you're feeling that nudge, maybe to come back and maybe for the first time, and you're saying, God, I want to follow you. I know there's something bigger than me. I know there's something greater than me happening here. And I want to give my life to that. If that's you this morning, would you slip your hand in the air right now? Would you slip your hand in the air? I see your hands. I see your hands. Yes, I see your hand in the back. I see your hand in the, in the, in the back again. Anybody else, are you feeling that nudge? Don't let this moment pass. Yeah, I see your hand. And if that's you this morning, I want to invite you to pray with me. I want to invite you to repeat this prayer after me and say, Jesus, forgive me for all the things I've done wrong. I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you are my Savior. And God, today, I give my life to you. God, today I go down a different path. From this day forward, my life is yours. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.